Good morning. Nice to be here. Thank you for your time. I'm trying to find this clock, and it's right there. So we are on the clock, um, and let's get right to it. Chairman McCall, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's amazing, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you felt the same way, that it's been 15 years since 9-11. Uh, first question, and I wanted to talk about what I think for a lot of people in this room may be the obvious, which is how this threat has evolved over the last 15 years, Al-Qaeda, now ISIS. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the threat has changed. I think people ask me, are we safer? Um, I would say uh, we are not safer, but the threat has uh, evolved into a different kind of threat. Uh, I think pre-9-11, um, we were looking at bin Laden, uh, who had a primitive form of communication, caves and couriers. Uh, people ask me just between Al-Qaeda and ISIS, bin Laden and Baghdadi. Um, the difference is really the internet, the power of the internet. They both um, <clears throat> sort of subscribe to the seventh century AD philosophy. The difference is I think today we have a new generation of terrorists that are very savvy uh, on the internet and know how to exploit it, both to recruit to train and to radicalize from within. So what we see is 40,000 foreign fighters that have converged from 120 different countries into what's now called the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And this was done predominantly over the internet, uh, something that bin Laden couldn't do. I think the, the, the Al Qaeda, old Al Qaeda structure is very a top down command and control, big spectacular events. ISIS is very much bottom up and do whatever you can, wherever you can. The directives I see coming out of Raqqa, Syria are basically two. One, come to Syria to join the fight, or two, kill where you are. Uh, both are, impact the homeland in terms of foreign fighter travel that could get into the United States, but also people who can radicalize <clears throat> over the internet, which we've seen uh, recently uh, in many of the uh, cities that we've seen attacked in the United States where people have radicalized uh, to carry out these attacks. Now, having said that, we have created an apparatus, and some, I think the Atlantic did a great uh, article, piece on this issue, um, <clears throat> on the, the changes we've made, both to air travel, uh, both intelligence sharing, um, and, and breaking down the silos between uh, law enforcement and intelligence, uh, and foreign governments that I think has created a, that's created a safer or at least a better protected environment where it'd be very difficult to pull off a 9-11 style hi hijacking event. So what we're looking at now, the more the threat is the, uh, the active shooter, suicide bomber, uh, IED, uh, more small scale attacks. You have said uh, in a tweet, I think on September 2nd, that the administration is playing whack-a-mole uh, with this, that this should be more of a, a war time strategy. Uh, but you've just said that this is sort of an unconventional enemy in how it is uh, reaching out and recruiting. So how do you fi fight a more conventional war against something like ISIS? Well, it, yeah, it's not, it's not a conventional war. I mean, my dad was at World War II, uh, air campaign for D-Day. We defeated the Nazis, defined them for what they were. This is more, probably more akin to the long-term what President Kennedy called twilight struggle we had against an ideology, and in that case it was communism, and that took about 40 years to defeat. I think we are, we have to have the military strategy. I think it's taken four years for the president to get to that point. We are having some limited success now. Clapper has said, though, it has not impacted their ability or capability to conduct external operations, but I think we have to look at it from that mindset that this is gonna be a generational ideological struggle as well, not just all military, but diplomatic, political, and the idea, ideological and war of ideas issue, and um, know that it's gonna be, again, a, a generational struggle. But if you were advising a president or in the White House at some point, would you, what type of military strategy would you recommend? Well, we've known about ISIS. I got briefed on them in a classified setting you know, over four years ago. We didn't do a whole lot about it. We'd sort of downgraded that threat um, I would say that we have to um, defeat them at their core. Uh, the best defense is a good offense. So militarily, so go to Syria and Iraq. Militarily, we have to deal with the, the, the dynamic with Assad. Assad's a magnet for the jihadists. Now with the Russians in there, we've completely, our, our inability to take action 
is a decision in and of itself. And I think that has created a more complex, more difficult scenario now with the Russians in there. Uh, so you have Assad in there, ISIS. We have to make ISIS the number one priority militarily and defeat them. The military, tell me, that can be done if we have the political will to do it. But we also have to have the, the political reconciliation within Syria, which has a civil war going on, and the diplomatic uh, uh, resolution. Iraq, there are many mistakes made in Iraq under both administrations, Bush and Obama, but I think the lack of a status of forces agreement and the failure to engage Prime Minister Maliki uh, imploded the situation, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq then uh, morphed in, in its ugly head into ISIS. Would you endorse what the GOP nominees said last night on uh, another network about... <laughs> <laughs> another network about um, a closer alliance with Putin and Russia? I think uh, I, would, I would urge caution. And I've been in the briefing room with them on national security issues. Uh, I think we do have a common enemy. Uh, the Russians uh, don't like the Islamist jihadists, and we obviously uh, are at, at war with them as well. Uh, but you really can't trust them. And the idea that Putin is somehow a friend of ours, or that Russia is a friend, I think is, is a false narrative. I think as Reagan dealt with Russia, peace through strength, and through that comes strength and diplomacy uh, as a way you deal with, with Putin and his aggression, I think, in Russia. But the fact is, they're in now. And that could have been avoided had we taken action four years ago. We have to accept the fact the Russians are there. What I, what I argued about was the fact that the Russians were not directing their strikes at ISIS, but rather the rebel forces uh, that we were backing against Assad. And so I think their number one <clears throat> objective there is to reinforce Assad stability in Syria uh, and working with Iran. And that's a dangerous alliance there uh, that I don't think, uh, again, they're not our friends. Mm -hmm. How does that, how would that strategy impact HVEs, homegrown violent extremists? Uh, how does that impact what's happening here at home and people who become inspired by that ideology? And that's, I think, that's where things have changed. I mean, you had operational issues with core Al-Qaeda <clears throat> driven out of central command. Now you have this uh, phenomenon over the internet of radicalization of homegrown violent extremism. How do, you, how do you stop that? How do you stop the guy in the basement? Uh, New York Police Department, John Miller, they, they call it losers to lions. So you have a guy who's vulnerable to this propaganda, who is looking for something greater than themselves, uh, and then they aspire to become a part of something greater that is ISIS. And so we see that um, taking place. Yeah, this is an odd uh, yeah, microphone it fell out there. <laughs> um, that is really hard to stop. When you have someone in their basement with the glow of a computer radicalizing, we saw that happen in, in Orlando. Uh, we saw that happen in San Bernardino, Chattanooga, Fort Hood, and Boston. Mm -hmm. Most of the cases that happen in the United States are uh, along that avenue. Uh, in every one of the cases we missed, and We've stopped a lot of bad things from happening. I think it's, it's important to point out we've arrested over 100 ISIS followers in the United States. Uh, but how do you, how do you stop the, the one that you missed again? Usually in each of these cases, after the fact, when we talk to family members, friends, or individuals in the mosque, for instance, the Boston bomber, Tamlin Sernayef, was so radicalized that he was kicked out of the mosque, and yet we didn't know about that. That's the kind of thing that if we see the warning signs of radicalization early on and provide an off-ramp or spot it to the authorities, then that's how we stop these attacks. Is this HVE threat, is that something that is, uh, it has improved over time in, in that there are fewer threats out there for the FBI and local law enforcement and joint terrorism task forces to deal with? Uh, is it decreasing or is it rising? I just had my threat briefing yesterday without going into the details of the classified space. The numbers are increasing. The number of home, uh, homegrown uh, violent extremists is the, increasing. The number of threats, the number of investigations, uh, the number of, of plots. So it was 
you know, uh, Director Comey has talked about a thousand investigations across the country in all 50 states. So that number is rising, uh, multiple thousand, or not that high? I, the number is very sensitive, but the number is rising. And the number of plots, we put a terror threat snapshot every month out of my committee, and each month the numbers are going up. So to me, that's, that's what's concerning, is it's not going down, it's going up in terms of uh, the number of threats, the number of individuals, and it's very difficult to cover and monitor that many people in the United States, much less the internet activity, and how do we stop that? Uh, how do we stop ISIS from radicalizing people in the United States? You know, it's a First Amendment a question, question about when does it cross over into not being protected by the First Amendment. There's a lot on the internet, uh, how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mother, right? Uh, things like that, that that disturb us. But the the numbers are going up. And, and one thing we are failing at, I think, uh, uh, is the counter-narrative. Uh, the idea, uh, the war of ideas, as I talked about before. Now, the State Department used to do this through Voice of America with an American flag. Uh, they realize that's not working. So globally, we have to use credible voices and the voice, voices of leaders in the communities and religious leaders. We need to do the same thing in the United States. And that's what I've talked to Jay Johnson a, a lot about in terms of how can you reach out to the community with credible voices and leaders, religious leaders in the community to say, this is not our religion. Uh, this is not a good path for you. Uh, this is not a good way of life. Uh, only in that long-term ideological struggle are we going to win this thing. Well, it's interesting that you say the number of investigations are rising because at the same time, the FBI has reported that the number of travelers, people going, trying to get from the U.S. to Syria, Iraq, the battlefield, that number has, has gone down to a trickle. So... What you're suggesting is that these people are staying here. They're staying at home. Well, the number, so you have the foreign fighter threat and the radicalization over the internet threat. Um, so the number, but the number of cases have, have gone up. The number of, of people, their capability to travel to the region and back has gone down. I think our limited military success now is having an impact on that. Although, again, Clapper has uh, indicated that hasn't, compromise their external operation capability. Um, so, uh, and, and don't forget, as we squeeze them in Iraq and Syria, what we're seeing is I went to Northern Africa two months ago um, and was in Sinai in Egypt, where ISIS is, uh, met with President Sisi in Cairo in Tunisia, uh, which is a fragile democracy, but the largest foreign fighters per capita. And Libya, right next door, got briefed by the Libyan ambassador in exile and his team uh, talking about how Libya is a failed state, and there are now 6,000 plus ISIS fighters in Libya. Um, they move. They move to power vacuums and safe havens. That's always a breeding ground for terrorism from which they can conduct external operations. Yeah, you've talked about sanctuaries that are developing uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, anywhere else uh, around the globe. We're seeing you know, activities now in Indonesia. And really through the internet, that's the frightening thing, is the global reach uh, that they have through the power of the internet. And again, going back to the premise of your initial question, that is the core difference now between traditional, what we saw Al-Qaeda before 9-11, and the threat that we see today. Well, how do you counter that? You, going back to something you said about a minute or so ago about the message that uh, we are communicating. Um, over the last year, and I don't want to point to any one thing in particular, but during this campaign season, um, has some of the rhetoric uh, been a negative in, instead of a positive in, in, in terms of countering the message? Yeah, I, I think um, if you, uh, inflammatory rhetoric can incite and can actually advance recruiting efforts. Uh, so I think we all, I'm always very careful, I think, about what I say. Is there any concrete TV. evidence that that has happened, uh, that it's spiked over the last year and a half? Uh, is there anything that suggests that, that has been Well, I don't case? have any statistical numbers to, to mm -hmm. but I, I think that's just kind of a, a, a sort of a well-known principle that that's going to inflame that community. I, but again, I think we need to, or I do agree with the nominees, we need to take a tougher stance militarily. I think we're finally doing that now. But you can't 
drone strikes alone are not going to kill an ideology. So in addition to the military strategy, you have to have the political diplomatic resolution to this. And then finally, the counter narrative strategy to defeat the ideology. Now, is it if, if you're talking about introducing more troops, I think 15 years after 9-11, there are a lot of people in America who don't want to see that. So how do you thread that needle, say that this is something that is necessary, uh, and speaking to some family uh, in the Midwest or in the West, anywhere across this country that has seen a loved one go overseas and doesn't want that to happen again, how do you sell that message to this war-weary public? Well, I don't think there is a lot of appetite for that. Uh, I, I think we've tried these rebel forces in Syria, and for the most part, it's been a, a failure. Um, as long as Assad is there, he's going to be a magnet. Um, I think the Arab League of Nations, it's their backyard, it's their religion, it's their responsibility to step up to the plate. They tell me that they made that offer to the president, but they were, were turned down. Um, but I think a U.S.-led coalition and a real coalition, a full participation but it has to be led by the United States and also bring in the Arab League of Nations to provide that fighting force. We're already there. What about Russia? And Jeff, we're already there. But what about Russia? Uh, that, that's where it gets tricky. With Russia, we're tr really trying to deconflict where we're, we're striking. Now, if the Russians want to hit ISIS, then I'm all for that. And that's the only common interest we have in that part of the world right now. All right, we have about five minutes left. Wanted to open it up to questions in the audience. Right here in front. Um, Troy Jackson, Howard University Oops. School of Law. Um, you mentioned a lot about how the changing landscape of global terror, they've become more sophisticated abroad. With HVEs here in our country, do we see um, the threats here becoming more sophisticated, or are we simply not responding to the same old traditional tactics? Um, see, these are the most bizarre microphones. Well, that and a letter <laughs> almost took me out, but I'm gonna, stage, I'm gonna scoot up a little bit, you know why. Pretty, I know we're talking about some pretty dark stuff, but I... Uh, <laughs> Just warn me, please, because I don't think I signed that release. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, I, I, the idea that you're gonna have uh, a lone wolf pop up is, is nothing new, but it's increased in its numbers. And as I mentioned, the numbers have increased uh, in terms of investigations. And it is primarily attributable to the power of the internet. And you know, the, the type of person that is vulnerable to that message and messaging. One thing I've encouraged the private sector to do, so Twitter will actually take down uh, handles that they see as, they term as jihadists. Uh, they've taken down quite a few. Of course, they'll pop up with another Twitter, Twitter you know, handle in the near future. The other thing is Google uh, will provide a counter narrative pop up when you type in jihadist terminology. Um, and Facebook has started to do some of this stuff. And, and so we've got to find a way to stop this internet radicalization process. And it is the ideas on the internet that are influencing these, what they call losers to lions. And it only takes a handful of people to do a lot of damage, as we've seen. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Gopal Ratnam. I'm a reporter with Congressional Quarterly. Um, this morning, there's been a lot of conversation from the podium about reforming the Department of Homeland Security, making it more efficient. But as chairman of one of the more powerful committees in the House, do you think there's any appetite in Congress for pro providing better oversight reforming the number of committees that oversee DHS. This mm -hmm. morning, for example, Secretary Johnson said that he spent way too much time not only uh, you know, going to committee hearings, but also answering questions from you know, several dozen committees. Um, and so I'm asking if you, if you think that there's any appetite for making it more efficient and streamlined from congressional point of view. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, to your first point, uh, we're gonna develop in the next month uh, sort of uh, idea of what the department should look like in the future moving forward for the next administration. Uh, but to your point with respect to Congress, um, you know, this committee was put together as a political compromise uh, with the idea it would be fixed down the road and it never was. Uh, I just met with the speaker yesterday talking to him about this very issue. Uh, I agree with Jay Johnson. It, it, you know, the one recommendation of the 9-11 Commission that was never followed was this point that you're making. 
and that as a single committee in the House and Senate that this newly created department report to. Now, they report to over 100 committees and subcommittees. It's dysfunctional, it, it, it cripples the department, and quite frankly, I've had legislation myself, like the Visa uh, Security Waiver Bill, that got held up for three years because of jurisdiction, and it wasn't until Paris happened that I was able to get that bill on the floor, and it took the intervention of the majority leader of the Congress to get that action. That is where jurisdiction, I would argue, puts the American people in harm's way, and shame on Congress for not fixing this problem. I'm gonna propose that we change this in the next Congress, uh, because it's my responsibility, and I think inaction will cause uh, problems for us. Mm -hmm. do, so, do you agree that there are a lot of hearings? I mean, every time we look up, there's some law enforcement official on Capitol Hill testifying. Um, you know, I worked in New York for a long time, and so, you know, three years ago when I came here, that process of having these officials on Capitol Hill all the time, you know, one of my comments was, well, how do they get any work done? Um, right? So, yeah. are there too many hearings? We have an oversight responsibility, but I agree with the 9-11 Commission that that oversight should be driven from the Homeland Security Committee. And I'm not saying that because I'm chairman. I'm saying that because particularly the, the department, unlike State Department or Justice Department, who have one Judiciary and Foreign Affairs Committee that I serve on, um, again, over 100 committees and subcommittees, makes a department dysfunctional because all you're doing is responding to Congress and testifying instead of doing your primary mission, and that is protecting the American people. All right, can you give us, we have a, about 30 seconds left, uh, a preview of what this report on DHS is gonna recommend to the next president? What, streamlining, uh, cutting employees? What, what are well, some I of the mean, highlights? It, it, you know, we're in the process, so I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but you know, a, a streamlining process, making it more effective. Uh, their, their technology is not being utilized as effectively uh, from an IT perspective with the cloud to uh, integrating the 22 uh, agencies in the department. How many departments do you think there should be within DHS? Well, that's something else. What, what can we consolidate? You know, and that's, we're in the process of doing that. I think we had one more question, though. I'd be happy to take it. We did. Somebody down here. Any other question? Right there? White, white shirt here? Thank you, thank you, Congressman. Uh, Brennan Kelly. You mentioned uh, the losers in the lions problem. Um, and are you concerned with too often some of these prosecutions of these quote unquote losers are being wrapped up into FBI investigations and prosecuted for crimes that they wouldn't have the, the capability to commit uh, without being kind of engaged with uh, FBI undercover agents? No, that was pointed out in the Atlantic uh, piece. Uh, these people are already. Um, going down the road, and the next step is to uh, an act of terrorism. Uh, it's not like they ca catch them at the very, very beginning. They're, they've already taken active steps, and we get, the FBI gets information, they've taken active steps to commit an act of terror. Uh, so by the time we get to them, uh, we're simply working uh, with them to get them off the street to stop that next step from happening. So. Uh, I would not apologize for the FBI on this one. I think they saved a lot of American lives uh, by what they've done. One last point we didn't get to sure. touch on, a very important issue is cybersecurity. Um, I think we look at uh, Islamist-based terror, which is small-scale terror. The cyber piece uh, could cause far more damage and consequences uh, than anything we have out there. Uh, ISIS cyber terror or nation state? Well, ISIS is trying to develop that capability. I'm talking more nation state like Russia, China, Iran. Uh, they are developing great capabilities. Uh, our foreign adversaries are developing this where they could shut things down. We've heard the allegations about influencing the elections. Uh, all, you know, I, I wrote a book called Failures of Imagination. We talk about this particular threat uh, as one that uh, is really, it's not the future, it's, it's here and now. All right, and that'll be the last word. I told you about the clock. We're out of time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff.